there, and welcome to another edition of the 1% Better Podcast with your host, Rob O'Donoghue. So folks, welcome to the 1% Better Podcast, and tonight I am really, really excited to be introducing my guest on the West Coast, David G. David G, welcome to the show. It's an honor to be here, so thank you so much for inviting me, Rob. Um, and we're doing this over video. Pity I didn't do this live because it could have been interesting. Uh, y- your background is a little bit more um, colorful, I suppose, and natural than mine. You probably can see certain kind of books in my background here. But uh, yeah, making me a little bit jealous, uh, David G. But you've given me some energy. Now it's getting late in the evening here, so I know we have about an hour. And I do want to get into hear your story and get as much good stuff out of you as possible. So, so again, thanks for doing this. My pleasure. So when I was doing the research, and I like to do the research, you know, meditation for me has been something that has come into my life maybe about three or four years ago. I've been working in the corporate world for about 20 years as as well. And when I say as well, I think that's kind of around the same mark or milestone that you had been in that world. And uh, it was just interesting, some of the parallels that um, I read about you that I want you to talk about that have kind of come up for me over the last while. I do want to hear about the sweet spot of the universe. I want to hear about the gap and I want to kind of get into ideas around (laughs) where that came from. But I must say, when I started to listen to your guided meditations, I think it was on Insight Timer, one of those apps. It was your voice that completely just captivated me. And it's been described as as the velvet velvet voice of stillness, I think. Yes, I was given that moniker um, about 10 years ago. Um, I don't introduce myself as, hello, I'm the velvet voice of stillness. Um, but, um, but I like that when someone says, hey, you're that velvet voice guy. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I was, um, I don't have anything to do with that. I can only attribute my voice to my parents. <laughs> Whatever they created, that's, that's what comes out of me. Well, it's very distinctive. It's very cool. And uh, it certainly helps kind of bring me back to the present moment when I hear it uh, in the mornings. So, so, David G., talk to me about, I like to go back to the very early stages, right? What's your earliest memory when I say that to you? What comes up? Gee, my earliest memory? It's funny. Um, you know, I've reinvented myself a whole bunch of times. Um, and in my most recent book, Sacred Powers, I even talk about, you know, the, um, the divine principle of, of rebirth. Um, so I think that's, um, I think that's almost a requirement for all of us to keep dying to the past and keep reinventing ourselves, keep moving towards some higher level, um, of our best expression. Cause I know that, you know, for most people, probably for everybody, uh, pretty much, you know, whoever you were 10 years ago with all that information, with all that experience, with all those falling down into holes and with all those, um, broken hearts along the way or crawling through glass. Um, we're so much stronger now and we have a new, a new platform. Mm-hmm. So, um, talking to you probably when like my oldest memory was, um, uh, my mom died when I was relatively young, but uh, she was an artist and she was a she was a creative. And on one of my birthdays, I don't know, maybe 12, 13, she gave me a, a copy of uh, of Ulysses by mm. James Joyce, mm. and she inscribed it as "You are my Ulysses, keep journeying." And so, you know, for the last many many years, I continue that that mission and that vision. Um, to keep to keep journeying, so you know that's probably one of my oldest, fondest uh, memories of my mother uh, gifting me and um, sort of like anointing me as um, as a journeyer, as a traveler, mm. um, as someone who just keeps moving forward, an adventurer. Mm. And I think that's informed so many of the choices I've made over the years as well. Mm. Very interesting. My mum died when I was 11 as well, which is kind of interesting that we have a <laughs> similar uh, parallel there. So so growing up then, David G, you went to the corporate world. Were you this ambitious, driven type of individual that was after the, the dollar? Or where, what, like, what was your kind of early forming values like? Yeah, well, um, you know, I grew up in New York and New Yorkers pretty much, um, you know, as they come out of the womb, the doctor whispers 
into their ears. Okay, here's how it works. Um, effort and focus. And if you don't get what you want, more effort. And if that's not working, more focus. And so that's, that's how we're all, you know, that's how we're all created. Um, New Yorkers have that sometimes as a, as a bad reputation. Mm. Um, but I've always been driven. I've always um, had a vision. And that's changed so many times over the years. But I've always wanted to be um, the best version of mm -hmm. what I could be. So whether that was in school or whether that was um, in, in sports, um, in the corporate world, that was like, you know, let me be the best. Let me, let me figure out how can I sort of like up level myself in every moment. So I don't know so much that it was um, money that right. I was seeking as much as to um, be the best for myself, be the best version of that thing. Um, but at a certain point in my life, um, I had sort of like this little aha moment that my life was really just about, uh, I began questioning why am I here? What's my purpose? Mm -hmm. what, why am I showing up every day? Why do I work for this company? Why do I, why am I involved in, in this type of business? Mm -hmm. And um, Was there anything that triggered it? Anything that triggered this kind of starting the yes, introspection? Yes, yes, yes. Well, you know, I, I had worked in the World Trade Center for a while um, on one of the higher floors of, of Tower 2. And it was really in the wake of 9-11 when I saw, you know, um, you know, our, all of our world shifted on that day. We, you know, none of us ever, you know, mm -hmm. I guess it's a little different, honestly, um, growing up in Ireland or certainly in, in Northern Ireland and, and knowing that there's violence right around the corner. But, you know, mm -hmm. growing up in New York, there really was never any, any, um, any massive Terrorism. type of yeah. violence or, or chronic violence. And so really in that moment, um, really of 9-11 and in the wake of 9-11, um, everything I believed was true turned out not to be true. Things that I thought would always be the same really just blew up. And I think it was in that moment where I started asking myself, well, if all of this stuff is so transient, if what I believed I thought I was here for is not that, and if I have an emptiness inside of me, hmm. what is my purpose? Why am I here? What's the, what's the meaning? What's the legacy that I'm going to experience um, in this lifetime? You know, what should I put my attention on? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where I really began uh, some, some really deep soul seeking and self reflection. And I would say like, sort of like, you know, it just turned out that I put that part of my life, I didn't put it to bed, but I sort of put it on hold or just let it go. Mm. Um, I guess in the, in, the, in the New York sense, we would say, oh, I just blew it all up. Mm -hmm. um, but I just left that world and began a journey of self-discovery. And I began seeking for deeper meaning. And instead of just working to, uh, to achieve some quantity of money or some paycheck, um, I began seeking um, purpose mm -hmm. and seeing if I could, you know, find like, What's the reason that I'm here? You know, the 7.6 billion people on the planet now. Um, why are we here? What's, what's this thing all about? And so I, I didn't have any answers at that time. And I was feeling pretty empty um, and unfulfilled at that time on so many different levels because I had just begun living to work. Mm. And, uh, you know, and I worked with a whole bunch of people who were living to work. That, that was our life. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't know that there were tools. Mm -hmm. And that's really what's unfolded in my life over the last 15 years is that like, oh, uh, I didn't know there were tools. Right. So people don't have to blow up their lives and people don't have to suddenly like end it all and begin some journey of self-discovery. If you if you know there are tools and if you can learn the tools to bring yourself into deeper self-reflection and be more patient with life in general, allow it to unfold rather than forcing it to unfold, then we can find deeper meaning and we can uh, even embrace the things we're doing with greater grace. And so that, um, that for me was like 
set me on my course. Right. Was there was there one was there the first first step was there the first tool maybe that you started to use to say there's something in this because I guess try to maybe just bring it to myself in that I've tried meditation numerous times over the years and I firmly believe that there is a point where timing is everything and that, that you know all of a sudden it starts to make a difference because at that point in time is the right time um, before that it was ne- not the right time and I was forcing it but you know the stars aligned right. or whatever but but it then just started to develop that habit and what I've always found was people that know me noticed the change in me before I noticed it myself and that kind of gave me kind of a bit of a momentum does, does that I can, I'm seeing you smile there so I'm wondering does similar stuff go off for you yeah I began meditating when I was in college so I had a totally different mindset at that time it was an experimental Asian studies class we had a a Zen um, Buddhist as a, as a teacher of this class. Um, there were 12 of us. We sat in a circle. Our Zen master stood in the corner. We were instructed to raise our hands during meditation when we had a thought. In his hands, he carried an 18-inch bamboo stick known as a kesaku. Uh-oh. And when we raised our hands, he would come over and hit us on the back with that stick. So I only lasted in that school of meditation. Uh, <laughs> couple of weeks right. but I found that like when I, I I had like touched something when I was meditating and I was like wow that's pretty cool so I left that school of meditation but over the years then I practiced candle gazing and tantra you know the, the sexier forms of meditation um, I practiced mindfulness and vipassana and got into mantra based meditation mm-hmm. and um that was, you know, some of those techniques lasted for a couple of weeks. Some of them lasted for several years. Mm. And uh, then I really, as I got more deeply involved in the corporate world, uh, my meditation practice slipped away. And I think that's the thing that um, that most people, you know, don't know if, if they haven't meditated. It's actually a daily practice where we actually have to show up and practice this thing mm-hmm. uh, similar to brushing our teeth you know we don't brush once and then go okay I'm good to go yeah uh, it's something we have to show up every single day for but but that daily ritual slipped away from me mm. as I got more deeply involved and it's not like I suddenly chose not to meditate I just chose other things mm-hmm. I chose to you know wake up early and take a, a train ride to work um, and at the end of the day I chose to uh, drink you know, uh, a nice big glass of of, uh, of scotch, quite honestly, yeah. instead of meditation. Mm-hmm. And suddenly I realized, well, my, my meditation practice is gone. But I also noticed that that balance was gone mm. from my life. And as I got more deeply involved in the corporate world, I was trading in my own self-care, my own welfare, my own physical and emotional well-being um, in this quest to, you know, to, to work and work and work. And... Uh, so a practice that I once found so beautiful and so balancing and like going to my safe space or going to my comfort zone uh, pretty much vanished. Hmm. And that was that was that was uh, that was my negligence. I don't think, uh, you know, I've since learned that we can have high powered jobs or really throw ourselves into the work that we do hmm. and have balance mm-hmm. uh, if we choose it. And hmm. we can certainly integrate meditation into our lives no matter where we are we can we can be um you know the most um high powered uh, business person uh and we could you know or or, or we can be a, a, a poet and you know it doesn't mm. matter you can always you can always integrate a practice into your life that's going to help you connect to that stillness and silence that rests within yeah when you look back on the corporate world that you were in 20 or so years ago and look at it now like even in those days if somebody came in and said well we're going to do a bit of meditation today how would that be looked upon back in the you know the 2000 early 2000s w- w- in new york yeah, well, was in my world in my world which is mm-hmm. come on come on mm. get it done uh where we don't wait five seconds certainly on the east coast you know now you can tell i live on the west coast mm-hmm. um of the of the US and you know I'm in Cal- Southern California right now yeah. south of LA even LA is even a little too fast paced yeah. um, my liking although I visit it you know pretty frequently yeah. um, 
but I, it, it was not respected. And, and I think really, you know, in society in general, you know, just take a step back a decade. Uh, just the vision of someone sitting with their eyes closed doing nothing is perceived as uh, not, necessar- not necessarily um, the actions of a high achiever. Exactly. Not someone you'd want to hire, certainly. Yeah. And not someone who's succeeding. You know, and since then, we've seen, you know, Oprah Winfrey meditates and Richard Branson meditates and, mm. um, and Ariana Grande meditates. And suddenly we start to realize, wow, some of the most Steve Jobs was a meditator. Yeah. Uh, we suddenly start to realize all these really high powered visionaries and spectacular creatives in our world have a practice to get them, you know, reel them in um, to their best version. I've even had the opportunity just last year um, had the opportunity to uh, to spend several hours with the Dublin um, uh, Guardi, yeah, uh, and uh, and and a bunch of of these guys who mm-hmm. were a little resistant at first, like wait a second, what, you know, you're talking mm-hmm. to me, you know, about this. Um, they were very very receptive to a lot of the techniques because I shared them in a in a languaging that they could um, understand and receive. And you know, I've worked with. Dutch special forces, and I've worked with cops throughout the United States, yeah. um, and now in in Dublin, and uh, work with the military here, yeah. uh, Marines in the United States. And suddenly I realized it's really all about the languaging. Mm. Um, had someone come to me 20 years ago and said, you know, you know, we're going to do a technique to help you make more money. We're going to do a technique to help you uh, manifest all the things that you want in life and get them easier. Uh, I think we all would have succumbed to that, sure. but um, you know, meditation has that uh, that history mm. of someone sitting cross-legged in some cave, or you know, it's involved yeah. in some religion, or it's a cult, mm-hmm. and there's a guru, and you have to follow this organization's belief system. Mm. And I think um, you know, certainly, especially in a country um, where you're, um, you know, where there's a you know, a Catholic country sure. where we you know, a lot of rules and dogma, uh, that kind of stuff can be mm. seen as just makes you want to roll your eyes. And that's certainly how it was perceived in the, in the corporate world that I was working in. Yeah. But it's, it's, yeah, but, but now it's so, so different. And I know I'm part of a part of a corporate environment and I've been trying to bring bits and pieces of it in over the last while. And yeah, you get strange looks from certain people, but more and more people are, are jumping on, on the, on the, on the bus with the right, as was with the right language, as you said. So just just before we kind of get into more details around that, I want to talk about the, the techniques you use. When you left, when you decided, right, today I am not going to work anymore, I'm going to go on this journey, had you, had you, yeah, had you any savings? Was it like, right, I'm just going to see where this takes me? And, and I know you went into Deepak's um, Chopra's center to train. Maybe just talk to me about the day you decided to go and what happened immediately after. Yeah, I mean, um, so there was an interesting, you know, for I spent a lot of time in the, in, in the corporate world and a lot of time in business and specifically mergers and acquisitions where you pretty much mm-hmm. you're trying to, to figure out um, how can I um, make this entity more productive? Uh, how can I make this company more profitable? How can I make the people more inspired? How can I raise the level of pretty much all the things? that we do. And, and when I left my world and pretty much blew up my life, um, I, I knew I needed something else. I didn't know what I wanted or what my dream life looked like, but I knew that staying in the corporate world that I was in was not going to serve me. Mm-hmm. So uh, my wife suggested, she said, hey, there's this guy Deepak Chopra and he's doing a meditation retreat in Oxford, England. Mm. And I'd never heard of Deepak Chopra. So I headed over. So I quit my job. Just give up. Job and like, was insane. Right. You know, blew yeah. up my life. Left New York. Headed over to Oxford, England. Um, and did this meditation retreat. And learned some very, very deep techniques. Um, to really um, connect me to a part of myself that I really hadn't, hadn't touched in, in decades. And I continued to practice meditate we were meditating for like six hours a day and by the third day i suddenly realized there's a lightness inside my heart that has not existed for for 20 years Mm. i suddenly felt joy for the first time Mm. uh, that i could even remember 
Yeah. And I was like, I like this. This is really, really great. And my heart got lighter. My heart got lighter and lighter and lighter. Um, started being a little kinder to myself uh, on this journey. And when that was over, I headed off to, to India in right. search of the guru. And I searched high and low. I traveled through India for months, you know, looking for the answers. And it was only uh, a, a few days before my visa was about to expire <laughs> that I suddenly... Um, Actually, I was laying in a cashew forest in southern India, in Kerala, reading the Bhagavad Gita, and I read chapter 2, verse 48, which is where Arjuna, the greatest warrior of all time, suddenly says to God, you know, um, how am I supposed to live my life? And, and God, Krishna, replies, uh, Yogasta Kuru Karmani, which translated means, Yogasta, establish yourself in the present moment, Kuru Karmani, then perform action. And for some, I'd read that hundreds of times, but for some reason in that moment, bam, right. that hit me like a lightning bolt. And I was mm -hmm. like, that's it. If I can just get still, then I can hear the whispers of my heart. If I can just get still and quiet, then the fluctuations of my mind will slow and I'll hear the whispers, the guidance that I'm supposed to get from the divine or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I raced home and I got back to New York and I must have meditated for eight hours a day. And my friends, who are all these high achievers, were saying to me, dude, all you're doing is sitting around and meditating all day long. You know, aren't you going to like do something? And I was like, why? This is it. I'm in bliss. <laughs> all I do is meditate. It's beautiful. Yeah. And they were like, well, if you really want to learn something, why don't you learn to teach it? Mm. Once you like hook up with your pal Deepak again. Right. So uh, I'm fairly obedient. You know, I, I was like, okay. And you're a so, good listener, so... I, I left the East Coast, headed out to California, found Deepak had a center out there, and I approached him uh, and his partner, D Dr. David Simon, who were the co-founders of the center, mm -hmm. and they've been partners for like 15 years at that time. And I said, listen, I've got all these business skills. Let me integrate these into your business, mm -hmm. and in exchange, maybe you could share with me some of these secrets, these tools, these techniques. Maybe you could introduce me you know, to this whole world. Um, of spirituality, of meditation, of yoga, of Ayurveda, of all these mm. you know, ancient healing techniques. And so they said, well, why don't you become the, the chief operating officer of this entity? And in the process, you'll learn to meditate at a deeper level. Mm. You'll learn to teach meditation. And you can, you know, weave all your business stuff in while you're downloading all that other um, timeless wisdom. So I was like, done. And I committed myself to that. And it was magical. I don't know that anyone gets the chance to, to do that on a, you know, on a daily basis. But so every single day I was studying meditation, teaching meditation. I'd become certified in, the, in those first several months there. Right. And suddenly I'm showing up in front of 500 people and teaching them various tools and techniques hmm. at the same time that I'm integrating all of my business acumen into this thriving center. And so that for me, that was a beautiful lesson on balancing business and wellness, mm. which before, you know, my feeling was if you have too much business, then there's no soul. And if you only have soul, then you go out of business. Yeah. And I was able to find that, that blend. And so I was fortunate enough to, to have that gift for 10 years oh. to be, you know, I mean, uh, uh, I taught over 200,000 people in person over that period of time as I traveled around the world every single day. Sometimes it was three people in a room and sometimes it was 500 people for a, for a week. Mm. And that just gave me like a whole new understanding for how to language it, how to talk about it. Um, people gave me insights, what worked, what didn't work. Mm. Um, and that was, for me, that was a, the greatest gift that I could, could ever receive. And then it was in, in 2012, I was like, you know what? I've done this for 10 years now. Deepak Center is thriving and they're doing great. Let me see if I can travel the world and share these same teachings in different languaging contexts. Let me see if I can get into the corporate world and, and help people um, connect without it being woo-woo or kooky or... or or something that sounded like a, 
you know, like a spiritual journey. Some yeah. people just want to sleep better at night. Yeah. Some people just want to lower their blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Some people just want to think more clearly or make better decisions. And meditation can be the tool mm. to do all those things. And really, over these last 15 years, scientific research has proven out that yeah. this stuff works. Yeah. That it actually works uh, as a nourishing agent in our physical bodies. It allows us to be more patient, more creative, uh, allows us to have better relationships with people. So suddenly this thing that I originally approached as like a spiritual journey turned out to be this real practical, real world application mm -hmm. on how to better live life so we can be better expressions of ourselves. Brilliant. T two things came up for me while you were talking through that. Um, the, you know, combining your your passion for meditation and, and feeling better with your, your business skills it's almost you know it's, it's like the dream job almost applying your skills to, to be able to do that and the other thing you, you know the term quid pro quo which is something right. i kind of have on my little wall here of like a rule that sometimes if i'm doing something for somebody it's great to get something in return and in lots of ways you that's what was happening for you in in deepak center it was a, a quid pro quo agreement right yeah, it really was. I believe there needs to be an energetic exchange in every single relationship. It doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. Uh, you know, this could be in, in, the, in the most extreme levels of, of the corporate world. This can be in, in the legal world. Uh, this can be in just friendships that we have between, you know, our loved ones or our, or our friends or, or our colleagues. There always needs to be that energetic exchange. Doesn't always have to be the exact same thing, mm. but there, you know, I believe that if we're willing to to serve at a certain level, um, then we're going to receive back into our lives, and we shouldn't serve so that we'll receive, but it just happens. You know, Einstein even said, "Energy cannot be created nor destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another." So there's nothing new under the sun. Everything is an energetic exchange, mm. you know, and I mean, we see it in, in, in the world around us. We see, you know, the rain comes down and then it evaporates and it moves into other things. And, and you know, we see it in nature. We see it in science. We see it. Um, we see it energetically in in all the connections that we have in our life as well. Yeah. And so, yeah, that was um, that was a beautiful thing. I, you know, I would like to think that I was I was given at the highest level. But I think, you know, it's like a hug. It's like a kiss. You know, in all of those, you know, you may be giving, but you're also simultaneously receiving. Yeah, totally, totally agree. Intuition is something I'm very passionate about as well. H how has your intu intuition developed and grown? Or is it, is it always been something that you live by? And as you developed as a meditator in your career, has it become more and more prominent? You know, I think if we look at like, what's the definition of intuition, you know, um, it's insight of some sort. Mm -hmm. It's, um, you know, it doesn't mean that you're clairvoyant. It just means you can see the bigger picture of things. And I don't mean like, oh, I'm a big picture thinker. Um, I'll give you an example. There's a, there's a, a pretty cool movie called The Mothman Prophecy right. starring Richard Gere. It's okay. an old movie. It's like, I don't know, maybe it's 20 years old. And um, Richard Gere is like searching for like the clairvoyant expert because he he keeps getting these phone calls and someone keeps calling him up and predicting uh, natural disasters. And then like the next day, the natural disaster occurs. And he's like, how is this possible? How could someone be seeing the future and telling me about it the day before it happens? So he mm. goes to Chicago to find the clairvoyancy expert. I think that was Brian Cox in the movie. <laughs> and he says to him, like, does clairvoyancy even exist? Is there even like a you know, is it real? Can it exist? And Brian Cox, the clairvoyancy expert, points up to this hundred story building and he sees, says to him, you see that window washer on the scaffold up there on like the 80th floor from where he sits, he can see that there's a motorcycle two miles out heading towards an intersection at like a hundred miles an hour. And from where he sits on that 80th floor, he can also see that there's a car heading towards that same intersection at like 75 miles an hour. And he can see all the way from miles away that they're going to converge at that intersection. And if they keep up their speed, he can see that they're going to crash into each other. Mm -hmm. So he says to Richard Gere, does that make him clairvoyant? Is that window washer clairvoyant? No, he could just see the bigger picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when we think of like intuition, it's our ability to be able to step back out of our minutia BS mm -hmm. and say like, and see, you know, what's the bigger ripple 
that's out there in my life. It's yeah. not just this step I'm taking right now, but who are the people who are touched by this? What's the, the true vibration of this? What could be the possible consequences of this? And I believe that if you meditate, mm. and if you consistently meditate on a daily basis, ultimately you become more comfortable with the world around you. You realize that the world is not happening at you, mm. but it's happening. And we're part of it. Mm. And the more you meditate, the more you connect to the stillness and silence that rests within, the more you truly connect to that world outside of yourself as well. And instead of feeling that you're a victim, you move to survivor and then to thriver because you see all the pieces. And I have found that over the last, I don't know, 10 years, because of my daily meditation practice, it seems that so often the world is coming at me in slow motion yeah. and I can rather than feel like I'm rushed into something or making a knee jerk uh, choice or I'm making fewer decisions out of fear or desperation because I'm allowing things to unfold a little bit more. This doesn't make me a stoner or a slacker. Mm -hmm. You know, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. I still have goals and ambitions and I still have targets that I'm shooting for. And I think all people can do this, though, but we can allow things to just unfold a little more gracefully in our lives. And if we do, we won't force ourselves into situations because the universe is a lot bigger than we are. Mm -hmm. And if we can realize that the universe is inside of us, not that we're this thing, you know, flailing around desperately in this giant universe, then we start to realize that, like, we're part of everything. Great stuff. So talk to me about the, the, your own developments of approaches, methods, the sweet spot and the gap. Maybe give me some background around uh, the premise of both of those and how you developed them. Yeah, well, it's built on the premise that you are not your thoughts. We have 60,000 to 80,000 thoughts a day. And that's a really, really important aspect um, we're not our thoughts and we're not our physical body. Mm -hmm. And if we can suddenly realize that if we're not our physical body and we're not our thoughts, who are we? Mm -hmm. We are the space between our thoughts. Mm -hmm. And that if we can access that space between our thoughts, then that's the place where we can truly then, some people call it the gap, and for thousands of years, this place has been referred to as something. Um, but that's the key. Mm. And that's always the key. So I've referred to that as the sweet spot. Um, and I often say, you know, I live in the sweet spot and wherever you are, that's your sweet spot too. But this space between our thoughts, it's based on, Viktor Frankl even said, you know, between stimulus coming into us and response, mm. there's this. And we have to decide based on that, what is our response going to be? Mm. And so when we meditate, we actually connect to that space. Mm. And and the more you meditate, can you can you find that that gap expands, or, or you can stay in that gap for longer and start to kind of just be? Well, that we have to like understand this concept. So if we are indeed the space, right? And mm -hmm. this is a little esoteric. Mm -hmm. So, but if we are indeed the space between thoughts, then that's who we are, always. Okay. And we don't visit it. We don't visit it enough because we're always either in our heads or we're doing an action. We're always in the realm of physical activity, mm. either thoughts coming in or physical actions going out. You know, we're thinking, we're speaking, we're acting. Not a lot of time, truly, for stillness. Not a lot of time that we are actually allowing. Um, to let things unfold when we meditate we're not trying to get to the gap mm -hmm. because that's who we are mm -hmm. so really what we're doing when we meditate is we're letting go of all of our other 
conditioned behavior. We're letting go of our um, probably every single thing we've ever learned since we came into this world. And so that's the key. We're beyond that. We transcend all of our conditioning, all of the authority figures, all the things we were told to do, all the good, the bad, all the, all the heartbreak, um, all of that fear and desperation, all of the projections and expectations we would otherwise have. We're, and every time we show up every day, it's like brushing our teeth. We cultivate our ability to witness and so you can't know you're in that space when you're in that space, mm-hmm. only after the fact. So you're never like in the gap going, wow, this is freaky, man. I'm in the gap. Right. You know, essentially what we're doing is we're accessing a place that's beyond space and beyond time. And so that when we come out of meditation, we suddenly come back into that, into the real world with a teeny bit of stillness, mm. a teeny bit of silence just the teeniest bit of unconditioned self. And then our next thought has a little bit less conditioning in it. Our next words are a little more thoughtful and reflective instead of reflexive. And our actions, rather than being out of fear or desperation, can be a lot more purposeful. Mm. So that's essentially what we're doing, you know, and that's the key that we're able to, in any moment, pretty much say to ourselves, if I keep going to that space, then every time I come out of that space, everything in my world is flavored with just a little more of that unconditioned aspect of who I am. Mm -hmm. And we know probably every mistake we've ever made, every bad choice we've ever made, every word we've ever spoken that we wish we could take back and every action we've ever done that we regret was probably all because we weren't either mindful enough or thoughtful enough or patient enough um, or unconditioned enough. Mm -hmm. And so imagine we get to go to a place on a consistent basis. If we're a daily meditator, we just go, we get to go to that place Bring it in, bring it in, bring it in, bring it in, bring it in. And then when we come back, we're a little better version. I would always like to think that before I speak or say something to someone because my feelings have been hurt or because I wasn't really thoughtful about it, that there was just like a, maybe just an extra beat, Mm -hmm. an extra breath. Mm-hmm. That my brain was taking, my mind was taking, that my words were taking, where mm-hmm. I could say, ooh, I don't really need to go there. Mm-hmm. I don't need to hurt that person's feelings. I don't mm-hmm. need to be right in this moment. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't need to force this situation. Mm-hmm. I could maybe step back a little bit. But we won't give ourselves permission to do that unless somehow we find some practice that breaks it all up. And meditation is that thing, that pattern interrupt that can break it all up. And that's an ego thing, perhaps, going on a bit there as well. Is is it just what comes up for me there? Uh, You know, even two days ago, I saw something on Twitter that, you know, pissed me off. And in the past, I might have reacted to say, not that I probably would have, it just kind of would have bothered me for a while. But then I noticed it and realized, you know what? No, that's pointless. Just like it instead and and put out some gratitude and, and make it positive and it felt good, and I noticed that that's not something I might have done a couple of years ago. So is the ego at play in there? It's probably a bit of all of it, is it? Well, you know, I, I think so. I think, you know, the ego is a part of who we are. Mm. But rather than killing your ego or suppressing your ego, I think, you know, what you went through was sort of like to look at it. You know, if your ego is simply your sense of self, it's a, you know, it's an opportunity for you to look at yourself and say, what are, again, it goes back to the bigger picture. What are the longer term consequences yeah. of this action, right? When we think about, um, here's a perfect example that you brought up Twitter, but think about <laughs> how, many, how many careers have been destroyed <laughs> by people tweeting because they just couldn't hold on for like, I don't know, 10 seconds more before they suddenly blurted out something on Twitter or on social media yeah. and then suddenly then pissed off an entire nation. Um, you know, the, we get to experience this, you know, almost every day with our with the president of the United States. 
Yeah. And whether you like him or don't like him, the reality is that, you know, most of those tweets are reactive. Yeah. You know, I don't know that most of those t- tweets are are these thoughtful, reflective moments where, you know, you've scripted them out and then you respond. Mm. Um, you know, just last week, I don't know if you ever heard of Roseanne Barr, but yes. you know, she, she was a, you know, a, a relatively famous, you know, uh, comedian yeah. and, and, and TV star. And, you know, just within like, I don't know, within like seconds, her entire career was destroyed. You know, and we see this with so many people where like, you know, can't you just stay in that space of stillness? Can't you let the moment pass just for a moment? There's a beautiful quote by Lao Tzu, the ancient Chinese philosopher. And they say this is probably like 5,000 years old, but it's like, do you have the patience to wait until your mud settles and the water is clear? Can you be, can you remain unmoving until the right action arises by itself? And probably the right action arising by itself is you, you had that moment, you know, that self-reflective moment where you're like, I'm pissed off, but I don't feel the need to announce to the world that I'm pissed off. Let me sit with these emotions a little bit and let me see how that unfolds. Let me see what this feels like. Um, and I think, you know, we are better versions when we can take a breath. Mm-hmm. But you can only know to take a breath when you have cultivated your ability to witness on a regular basis. Yeah. Brilliant. And, and and nicely on to the 21 day, I guess, the 21 day challenge or, or is it the tw- what what do you is it as well as the 21 day meditation technique that, that you've been, I suppose, accredited with. And, and just to give you a bit of context, I've completed a, a coaching, executive coaching, life coaching diploma a couple of years back. And one of the exercises we did during one of the modules was to, to buddy up with another member of the class and give each other a challenge that we'd stick with for 21 days and then hold each other accountable, um, you know, text each other, call each other to see how you were doing. It wasn't necessarily all around meditation, but a lot of people in the class did take a, a 21 day meditation technique on that. But but this is something you've really cultivated yourself. Is that fair? Well, um, in the early 2000s, um, I figured, wouldn't it be cool if we could create, I had just finished reading Stephen Covey's Seven, Seven Habits, Habits of Highly yeah. Effective People. I know. You know. And he had said it takes 21 days to create a habit. So I was like, okay. I know what I'll do. I'll create a 21-day meditation challenge and um, meditate with people for 21 days. And every day I'll come up with a new technique or a new mantra and there'll be some theme you know, on a consistent basis. Mm-hmm. And that'll be like this beautiful scenario where I can, um, you know, guide people. And at the end of 21 days, uh, they'll have instilled some type of, well, they'll have gotten comfortable by showing up every single day. Mm. And so I created that. Um, so every day I did that for 21 days. This is while I was at the Chopra Center. And um, six months later, I did another one of those. And then about six months later, I did another one of those. And it grew from 5,000 to 25,000 to 50,000 to 100,000. Mm. And when it hit 100,000, I was approached by Deepak Chopra and David Simon. And they were like, hey, you know, we like this thing. We want in on it. We want to do this. Mm. So I was like, OK. And they said, you know, we'll take like three days each. And then we did it together. And then we started inviting other people who worked at the Chopra Center. And um, then Deepak said, I think I'm going to invite one of my most famous friends, who's also a meditator, Oprah Winfrey. And so I uh, said, absolutely, rock on. So now, you know, that that thing that they do together, I Hmm. think that touches, I don't know, millions of people. Sure. Um, They do that a couple of times a year. And other people around the world, you know, busted out the 21 day courage challenge and the 21 day compassionate challenge and the 21 day yoga challenge. And so, um, yeah, I've been, I was credited with that. I don't know that there were any one out there. I'm sure Stephen Covey probably is the original guy. Mm. But then it was funny years later. I don't know, like 2011. Um, David Simon, the co-founder of the Chopra Center, said to me, you know, it's not really 21 days. That's never been scientifically proven. You just made that up. I said, I didn't make it up. Stephen Covey made it up. He said, well, it's not true. It's actually 40 days. Mm. And in fact, the ancient Sufi poet um, Rumi said what um, 
nine months in the womb does for an embryo, 40 early mornings will do for your spiritual practice. Wow. And so I said, I know what I'll do. I'll create the 40 days of transformation <laughs> and um, at least 21 days is the halfway point. Yeah. And so, um, so that's what I've been doing now for the last five years or so. I'll roll out these 40 day challenges, which, you know, honestly, 21 is a little more accessible to most people. Most yeah. people are like 40 days. You're killing. Me. I can't do that. Yeah. Um, but I have found that everyone who goes through the 40 days, you're like locked in. Those people don't don't slip back. Mm. You know, if you meditate every single day for 40 days, there's a really high likelihood that you'll stick with it for yeah. a really long time. I agree. Uh, I've actually been doing for this year. I'm doing multiple challenges myself, but I do one every month. It's kind of 12 months, 12 challenges. So it's, I tend to, I try to aim for 28 days per month because obviously in one month there's only 28 mm -hmm. days so one of them i've been doing the 5 a.m challenge where i get up at 5 a.m every, every day and that's stuck now it's like embedded I, I i like getting up early anyway but the 5 a.m one has been really good but but um but yeah i think it's building that habit over any period of time probably longer than 20 at a minimum point probably is 21 i'd say but some people are probably more susceptible to taking on a at making a habit uh than, than others i, I guess have you found with people you've met over the years that have tried to start into meditation that just some people can't do it? Or is there, is there a type of person that meditation works better for? Um, you know, I think that's an excuse. I think that's an excuse that people um, who don't want to like really dive in. I think anyone, if, if there's one message that I could give, no matter who you are, no matter what's going on in your life, you can meditate. Mm -hmm. You can meditate and you can meditate anywhere. So that's why a lot of people, I think, think that, you know, they think, oh, I need to create some kind of meditation cushion. I need to yeah. have an altar. I need to like do all this other stuff. I need to have, you know, some spiritual practice. But I believe that anyone can meditate anywhere under any circumstance so if we just give ourselves permission that you have the ability resting inside of you at any time you want to actually um bust out a meditation practice and you can do it simply by watching your breath you can do it by repeating a mantra you can do it just by um sitting and um envisioning something inside obviously I'm a strong believer in having two bookends of your day, having a morning meditation practice to start your day in stillness and silence and having an afternoon practice or an evening, early evening practice. So that's the meditation where you sort of can like metabolize or let go everything that um, you've absorbed over the course of the day. So I'm like a really very, very big proponent of, I like to call it the bookends. Mm. And um, even if it's five minutes in the morning, five minutes in the afternoon, because we don't, you know, there's there's all this talk about mindfulness. Everyone's always talking mindful this, mindful that. But the reality is we live so much of our lives mindlessly doing things mm -hmm. without thought because we're just conditioned. Why do we do it? Because we've always been doing it. And if we can sort of like break that pattern introduce some kind of interruption, a pattern interrupt, then we're going to be better versions of ourselves. You know, it's the creativity that allowed you to, to create your podcast. Mm -hmm. It's the creativity that allows someone to start a new career or to um, forge a new relationship or at least even take that relationship to the next level. So I think that um, meditation creates a little space, that sweet spot, Mm -hmm. You know, that gap that allows us to perhaps suddenly create a little more creativity and give you an opportunity to go, oh, I hadn't thought of that before. But mm -hmm. it's hard for us to get there if we're just living in that same condition cycle mm -hmm. over and over and over and over again. Very good. I'm just reading. Uh, I love this part when you in, in one of your guided meditations use the mantra Yoga Chitta Vritti Narora. Did I pronounce that okay? Narorha. Narorha, okay. Yeah. Yoga Chitta Vritti Narorha. Yeah, because people ask me all the time, what's meditation? 
And I'll reply, oh, it's uh, Yoga Chitta Vritti Niroha. <laughs> What's that? And I go, we're not trying to stop thoughts because that's a big, you know, a lot of people are like, I still have thoughts when I meditate. Well, that's a good thing that you still have thoughts because no thoughts, you're flatlining and you're dead. <laughs> so that's not a bad thing um, to, to have thoughts. But Yoga Chitta Vritti Niroha, Patanjali, this ancient sage said this 2000 years ago, essentially, um, oneness is the progressive quieting of the fluctuations of the mind. And that's what we do every time we meditate. We actually progressively quiet the fluctuations of the mind. And that's why, so if your mind is running really wild, then it'll run a little, a little less wild. Mm -hmm. uh, but we can actually start to see things in a little slower motion if we are just willing to show up every day, just for a few minutes. Yeah. So you connect to that stillness and silence. Yeah, you can start to see how crazy everybody else is <laughs> when everything slows down a little bit and you kind of get off that kind of uh, merry ground a little bit. David G, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, just before we wrap up, uh, I always like to ask one more question and then maybe you have time to just shout out how people can get in touch with you and I'm hoping we can meet in person in Ireland at some point in the near future. If you could recommend a book and obviously recommend some of your own, but uh, another book that might have been an influence for you that you've read and gone back to over your career? Anyone stick out? I'd like to put one on my website after every episode. Yeah, well, um, I happen to have a copy of it right here. Mm. And it's yeah. um, Man's Search for Meaning, Victor E. Frankel. It's amazing, yeah. And, you know, this is like such a powerful book. It's only, you know, 165 pages. And this book um, is just so, such a deep, deep, dive it's it's an exploration of mm. um of of meaning it's an exploration of the soul it's an exploration of who we are what we're trying to accomplish um in life um you know in this book he says you know we can't avoid suffering because there's so many aspects of suffering in life you know just disappointment or unmet expectations or just life happens and we we can't even guess it but we can choose how we want to cope with it. We can choose how we want to find meaning uh, in it. And we can also find the strength or the will to move forward. You know, a lot of people think that the term resilience means that you're bulletproof, mm -hmm. but it doesn't. Resilience is our ability to get back up. Mm -hmm. And as long as we can get back up consistently, just get back up, get back up, get back up, get back up, then there'll be this magnificent unfolding in our life because we'll, um, we'll find meaning in that next moment and we'll be stronger in that next moment. Um, so I recommend this. Of course, you know, my newest book, Sacred Powers, for me, that's... that's um, I'm asked all the time by people. I get emails every single day. Should I quit my job? Should I dump my loser husband? And my response, but I can help you get to a place where you'll make that best decision. And that's why I wrote Sacred Powers, so that people could access by themselves that tool, that decision-making tool to help them make the most conscious choice, the one that will serve them and the other people in their life. Brilliant. Yeah, look, thanks for sharing that. I'd, I'll have the links to all of those on my website, back to your website. It's been an absolute pleasure to uh, hear your journey and take lots of learnings from it. I look forward to listening to one of your guided meditations tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. to get my day off to a good start. Uh, and look, have a great rest of the day, David G. And uh, definitely it'd be great to stay in touch and see hopefully we can c connect again in the future. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for all the work that you do. It's so, you are truly transforming the world. And you've done that by transforming yourself. So that's what I teach. That's what you teach. You know, and that's just, that's just beautiful. Thank you. Um, always remember the power of your ripple. And I would invite all of your listeners to just uh, trust a little more in their heart. Trust a little more in the divine. And their journey should be just aligning those two things, you know, you can do like hashtag I trust and just to keep moving in the direction of our dreams because we can manifest whatever we want in our life. And a starting point of that can be our meditation practice.
Brilliant. Great way to end it, David G. Have a, a great day. And again, thanks so much. Thank you. So, how did you find it? A good show? Hopefully. Do take a second or two to let me know. And before you do, dive off just a couple of quick call-outs. The new podcast, the 864, 15 minutes long, in fact, 864 seconds is the aspiration, is now out and ready for listening. Check it out on the site. Go to the podcast page. There's a link for 864 there. Or go on to Apple Podcasts and subscribe. That would be awesome. The 864 is all you have to search for. And it's in all other podcast platforms that you can think of or should be. So, have a listen. Every week I release a one-minute Monday video clip which is also a tip to hopefully make you one percent better check that out it's on the website on the video page did you also know that only about one percent of listeners to podcasts not just my own but all leave a rating leave a review get in touch or give feedback and i would love if we could book that trend and put it to two percent for this one so please do take the time to give me a bit of feedback give me some ideas about future guests or whatever the hell comes into mind just get in touch or rate or review the podcast on apple that helps i'm available at all of the social platforms pretty much all at rob of the green that's either with or without the at sign but you'll find it under that moniker so hopefully i'll hear from you there last couple of quick ones support so i do offer some pro bono coaching get onto the website the support page to get in touch few hours a month happy to do that and if you would like to support the podcast that would be awesome you can do so through patreon and also through purchasing books through the book page on the website that goes through amazon and we get a little percentage i'm not even sure what but it's something and finally just to say thanks for taking the time to listen to the podcast i know there's lots of other shows out there it means a lot that you're checking this one out so have a great rest of day week month year whatever it may be and Hopefully you're getting 1% better as a result of these shows. Take care and good luck.